This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of No Other Pod. We're here for a victory pod because Sporting Kansas City went into Salt Lake and they messed around and they got a full three points on the road to the number two team in the Western Conference, Salt Lake City. I'm here with my good buddy, Daniel Kuzer, who's sporting that retro state line kit. What's going on, yeah. my friend? She's, uh, they, don't, they, they don't make larges like they used to, buddy. These are, <laughs> you know, a large today is not a large in 2014. I tell you that. It is, uh, Adidas decided to pay a little love and be like, oh, large means actual larger humans? All right, well, <laughs> we'll start doing that. Yeah, that was, uh, especially if you got that authentic kit back then, it was, it was super tight. This is the replica, and this thing's like it's it's wild, bro. I put it on, and I was like, I know I put on it for you, but this is this is something else. <laughs> it's all muscle, though, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. No, no, I know no. my uh, my extra large certainly won't fit from then. So, yeah, I mean, we we I like to hold my weight in my belly. Yeah, some people like it in thighs and butt. Whatever works for them. Mine just likes to be in the belly. I don't get it. <laughs> I'll never understand. Yeah, well, it's uh. Man, if you would have told us at the start Ooh. of this year, if you would have told us 10 games into this year that we'd be sitting here a couple of weeks before decision day, because obviously there's no sporting KC game this upcoming weekend, but a couple of weeks before decision day and sporting KC has a game to play for to earn a spot in the MLS Cup playoffs, there's a lot of people I wouldn't have believed you. And that's the situation. Well, it's very important to state first and foremost that our fate is not in our hands. No. We got to get the job done, yes. but we also got to hope something else goes awry for someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, we're in it, bro. We're mm -hmm. in the game. Absolutely. And just uh, Here I was thinking we would go to Decision Day. I thought we'd be at Children's Mercy Park just because we're fans, not because there's anything to play for. Yep. But here we are, Minnesota coming in in a couple weeks, and... Uh, this league is wild, bro. It is. I mean, I guess this is what happens when, what, nine out of 16 teams or nine out of 15 teams make the playoffs in a conference, but it yeah. gives you hope, and and that's all you can ask for, really, at this point, if you're Sporting KC heading into the last game. Well, months ago, we were talking about potentially fighting for the wooden spoon. Yeah. Like, Which we that's literally had that conversation, man. Yeah. So... There's lots to talk about this week. There's a, all sorts of shenanigans happened in the RSL game. It's pretty wild. Um, before we get into that, we do have a brand new review to read. It's been a minute since we've got, we, we've had some ratings, but it's been a minute since we got a review, so you're ready to go. So why don't you go ahead and, and read the people what it says. I got it pulled up, man. It's from uh, Mad Cat MU. All right. They said, I'm here for the conversation. Five stars. Dan and Jimmy make a great team on No Other Pod, a podcast I've been listening to for years now. Ooh. The foundation of the show is their own perspectives and engagement with the fan community, but that is also enhanced by connections they have made with the club over the years. If you want just straight soccer news and analysis, this may not may not be for you, but I love it. <laughs> when the topic drifts to what the guys are watching on TV or what vegan recipes Dan has tried lately, it just feels like a fun conversation between old friends. Mad Cat. Awesome. Coming in hot, man. Thank you so much. Ray, uh, it's been a bit. It's been a bit since someone popped in there, so thanks for taking the time. That's cool. And I think, you know, that that's something that we've heard over the years is is for some people, they like the the banter when we get on our little sidetrack conversations and other people want that straight, you know, serious soccer analysis all the time, which, which that's out there. That's fine. But I think that's, you know, that's what we thought would set us apart from the get-go is, is we're just talking about it like two friends talk about it in a bar. So that's yeah. uh, that's kind of you, you get a raw and unfiltered look at what what we do when we we hang out for an hour every week. Oh, it's raw. I mean, we might spend <laughs> we might spend five minutes talking about this mustache situation I got going on. I've been know? staring at it. You've been staring at it. <laughs> it's a thing, man. It's it's a vision board, right? It's like a vision board. Travis Kelsey has a mustache, and he's one of the most successful people in life right now. So I'm gonna be like him. I'm gonna have that guy's life. Is that was that legit the inspiration? No, I was supposed to shave because I had a movie shoot uh, on Sunday and then okay. uh, they got canceled because someone got COVID. So I, I was shaving and I left the mustache on Saturday and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to leave the mustache. I don't care. Okay. A movie shoot. Did I not tell you this? I don't remember. You're Mr. Okay. Movie Star now? 
No, I just the I think list appearance at the end as the White Ranger in a Power Rangers movie, uh, starring the original Black Ranger. He's uh no what, way. Walter Emmanuel Jones. He's part of this. Uh, but it's it's a very much a racial thing. Uh, it's called Black, and my buddy wrote it. Okay, and it's been in the making for like half a decade now. It's been just taking their time, right? So I'm cool. the White Ranger. I come in at the end for like no lines because the white people don't get lines like it's not about that you know but still you're the white ranger that's some big shoes to fill tommy hey, oliver you know hey my rest favorite piece so yeah. he was definitely my favorite uh especially coming in being a bad guy and then switching to good guy you know Ooh. Uh, i love a good heel uh, a good heel and then face turn <laughs> that's that's pretty cool that's awesome no it was dope uh but someone got covid so they had to cancel it so yeah. what are you gonna do well if uh, if they reschedule it and you still get to do it, remember us when you hit the big time, Mister Hollywood. So, yeah, <laughs> that'd be that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, thank you for that five star rating and review. Uh, if you haven't yet done so yourself, go on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Leave us that rating if you can. Leave us a review. We'll go ahead and read it on there. So we appreciate it. Pretty cool. So yeah. Hey, uh, how's your how's your is your spooky season off to a good start? Do you ever get into spooky TV and movies at all? Do you care about that stuff? Uh, I'm not a big horror fan. Really? Um, I'm, I'm, I have like an appreciation for it. Uh, it, it depends. Like I really liked Haunting of Hill House. Uh, I'm really excited for what is it? The Fall of the House of Usher on Netflix. Right. Um, I'm not a big like gory guy. Like can't do Saw. Well, we're not, have never seen any of the Saws. We'll never see any of the Saws. And paranormal stuff that's like a little bit too like ex- the Exorcist. Um, that that touches a, a a religious upbringing nerve for mine that's still buried okay. down deep in there somewhere where I'm like <laughs> I don't believe it but I don't want to mess with it. So, do you like campy horror, like horror comedy type stuff, like sure. stuff that's kind of scary but makes you laugh? I, yeah, that that's fine. What I need to watch is um, which I, I didn't watch last year is Werewolf by Night, the Marvel one. Oh yeah, that's a fun one. So, uh, I'll tell you this: I just we watched Totally Killer on Prime Video. Okay. And it's kind of like a time traveling slasher, and it's uh, mm-hmm. it goes back to the '80s. And if you're a fan of '80s and all that sure. kind of stuff, it's pretty cool. But have you seen Happy Death Day? I haven't, but I've heard good things. That's some funny shit. Really good movies. Okay, so yeah, you know, I'm I'm I, I think I'm getting an appreciation for it as I get older. You know, there are certain like I saw both its in theaters. Those don't bother me at all because at all. Oh no! Oh my god! Like, this That's is a clown. Scary. This is a clown. This is not scary. In the second one, what did they do? They moving? They they bully it to death in the second movie. Spoiler alert! Like, come on. So, not that didn't bother me at all. The uh, Haunting of Hill House is probably the scariest thing I've watched in recent history. Well, I like watching stuff because I'm in the safety of my own home. But I'm not about to go. I'm not. I don't want to go to a haunted house just for the fact that someone fucking snapped and they're like, "This is the night." Where I kill someone and get away with it. Just some yeah. rando I stabbed 20 times. All part of the thing. They just set your body in a corner and people are like, oh, wow, it's really realistic. That's really, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I don't want to be a part of that. I, you know, I'm out, man. Yeah. People doing it at theme parks, worlds of fun, and they're, they're haunt and everything. See, nah. I have done, back when I lived in LA, I went to Not Scary Farm and, and I enjoyed that. That was fun. So, sounds like it's not scary. Well, not K N O T T. I know. Yes, I know. But it is scary, isn't it? It, well, yeah, I mean, the scariest part is when, I mean, you see it on TikTok now or whatever in the videos, there's fog everywhere and there's the the people that have the knee pads and they come and they slide by you and they hit the yes. ground real hard and you can't see where it's coming from. They do that at Worlds of Fun, coming yeah. and sliding on the pet. Get off the damn ground. <laughs> Trying to scare me. <laughs> I don't like that shit, man. Kick somebody. Unbelievable. About to kick someone. I, yeah. Thrown out in a heartbeat. Well, <laughs> our producer, Nick, is not a fan of clowns or scary movies, he says. so. I see I'm, that. Nick, Nick you know, needs to know. alone. We need to culture this bitch ass. I tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have not been to a haunted house in many years. Uh, I've not done the Beast or Edge of Hell, even though those yeah. are like supposed to be incredible. So no, no I did. Need, I... Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's not my thing. The, the the one thing we did last year is we did. Uh, they called it a spook easy at Tom's Town. Oh, that's they cool. Had, they they had like Halloween themed like drinks and whatnot, so that was cool. But... Love it. Well, wait, I get into all the new original movies coming out of like Hulu and Netflix. And if it's an original idea, right, that can, and it's good, that's yeah. arc some interest, man. Give me a good alien invasion or something. Yeah. Ooh. So, uh, but no, it's, it's going well. So we'll see. Good. Uh, I know that, uh, 
<laughs> uh, it's uh, it's getting a little spooky for uh, Sporting KC's playoff chances because things might get weird and Sporting KC might find a way to sneak in here. And it all started with this RSL game that we knew heading into Salt Lake City, which is a pretty Probably tough place lose. to play. And RSL was ahead of this game, sitting in second place in the West. You know, obviously they couldn't get first. St. Louis already locked that up. But RSL's fighting to, to host a, a, some home playoff games. They had everything to play for. And when you looked at Sporting KC going into this game, coming off of a, a pretty disappointing uh, St. Louis game and whatnot, this just, you know, things felt... A, a, a little shaky for sporting. Yes. Um, now, and, there's a stat out there, buddy, that we we bounce back after losses. That is true. Yeah. It, it, we don't lose two in a row. But it got a little bit more weird because a couple days before the game, Andre Fontes finds himself on the injury list. And, and now you're thinking, you know, if you remember... There's a man on our team named Robert Volader. We haven't seen him in quite a long time. He SPR2 great. Did I say SPR2? SKC2. Wow. Wow. That's a throwback. <laughs> yeah. SPR. Um, Mr. Volader has to step into the starting lineup next to Danny Rosero. And, you know, this is, uh, this is a pretty big game on the road against a very good RSL team with a couple of very good forwards in uh, Arango and Saverino who were probably going to run at you and, and give you all that you can handle for the full 90 minutes. So this this was a uh, an unfortunate but interesting wrinkle in the lineup that I don't think any of us saw. So yeah. I, I I don't I don't know if you seeing Volder in the 11 if that made you any more or less nervous. I was probably already at max nerves going into this game already, so I don't know if I could get more nervous, but what what, yeah. what were your thoughts when you saw that? You, what my thoughts are, we rambled too much about Halloween and we need to take a quick break, my friend. But let's <laughs> let's do a break real fast and okay. we come back and talk this game. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Hey, this game, <laughs> this was must-win situation. Everyone knows it. The fans know it. The players know it. You got to go in and win. And I, I'm, I'm terrified, dude. I'm like Robert Volader. Oh no! Mm-hmm. Like you, you've made me feel uh, negative thoughts for so long, my friend. That being said, played kind of well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what's been so, you know, frustrating about the roster build. You could say is that Volader and Denbe and Marino Shanis; those are the three U twenty two initiative signings, and many teams have been able to use their U twenty two signings to to be regular contributors. And and Denbe obviously has been starting the last few games, and he's been playing pretty well. But Volder and Johnny's just cannot see game action, it seems. And so Volder steps in here after, like you said, being with SKC2 for most of the season and, and not really seeing much game action uh, in a very tough place to play. That's hard. And then if you look at the midfield trio, Peter Vermees has seemed to favor Felipe Gutierrez quite a bit over the last handful of games. And I don't know if there's uh, a reason that Remy Voltaire or even Gadi Kinda are sort of not in that starting rotation right now. But you have a midfield of, of Tommy Rodoya and Felipe Gutierrez behind the obviously regular front three of Charlie Polito and Russell. And I don't know, man. I, I looked at I usually have confidence in that front line. I wasn't worried about that. I was I was a little concerned about the the midfield uh, and the back line. And pretty immediately a lot of the concern that I had went away in this game because things went just about as perfect as they could for Sporting KC right off the bat. Listen, let me tell you that I was busy. I was seeing a nine-goal thriller at the KC current game. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, watching the two worst teams in the league just have a shootout. <laughs> <laughs> but I was getting these notifications on my watch, and I was like, okay, game started. All right, like, Two minutes later, I'm getting one that says red card to RSL. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like this changes the entire fabric of the universe. Yeah. And this game is flipped on its head. It said three minute red card. But buddy, this happened like 37 seconds into the game. Mm-hmm. Justin Glad was like, I'm Justin Glad. I'm a star defender. I'm, I do all the right things. Then he grabs 
Like he's he dogs owes Eric Tommy. Well, and it, it was from his own doing because he got a back pass to to start the possession, and then he just Took is too flippant pass. with the ball. He's too flippant with the ball, and he he it reminded me of some of the things that Danny Rosero has done this year. But but Rosero more often than not last second gets away with it. Yeah, Glad tried to dribble around Eric Tommy. Eric Tommy was too quick, gets around them, and suddenly he's got a one on one headed right at the RSL goalkeeper. And you're exactly right. Justin Glad grabs him and pulls him down from behind. Now, what's interesting is this was not called on the field. This was not even right. called a foul on the field. And it was pretty obvious that now the ref was, was pretty far away, did not get called a foul whatsoever. RSL went down, had a chance, had a look at goal. And then yeah. at about the two minute mark, they signaled for a video review and credit to the referee. He didn't look at it very long. Uh, he just looked at it for, you know, a, a, a dozen seconds or so, came out, and pretty immediately, straight red card. And now Eric Tommy steps up for a free kick. Man, I, I saw the last 30 minutes of this game, by the way, when I got home Saturday night. Uh, so I watched the rest. I watched the beginning Sunday morning, and I was equally as hyped, like, as if I was watching it live. It was, <laughs> you, you, like, knew it was going to happen, but it's still awesome. Yeah. And this free kick, might as well have been a penalty kick because that puppy, dude, what were they doing with the wall? The wall <laughs> Parting the red goes, seat. Come on in. Like, shoot or pass us. Put your body on the line. Like, yeah. that just shows they don't want to get hit. Yeah, it was it was interesting. So, I we, we go up a man. RSL goes down red card. There's 88 minutes to play when the red card is shown. So, I, at this point, wasn't even thinking – you know, Tommy might score this on a free kick. I'm just thinking, okay, this is what we need. If Sporting KC can't capitalize on a do or die situation, up a man for almost the entire game, RSL might have just started the game with 10 players without arguably their best defender, even if it is on the road, what are we doing? If we can't find a way to win this game and get three points, this team does not deserve to be in the playoffs. So, thing, yeah, they're set up about as well as you could hope for. And then you were right, Eric Tommy. Steps up, and credit to Tommy for wanting to take this because often it's Polito when it's at you know within shooting range that Polito will sure. will take it. And you're right. He steps up. It's a good free kick, but it should have bounced right off the wall. But you're right. Both yeah. of the defenders turn sideways, and it goes right in between their heads, and it's one zero. I know. I said they just don't want to get hit by the ball. Now, don't get me wrong. When I played, I didn't get on the wall either. I was like, nah, I'm going to stay over here. Yeah, <laughs> You guys do the wall thing. I don't get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it either. So what do you well, do? Well, that's true. It froze It froze McMath in his place, but it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious watching it, especially in slow-mo, because there's an angle on, on the replay. If you watch, they show it from behind the goal. It goes through the wall. McMath freezes. He looks to his right, stares at, at it for a second then turns at his wall and just holds his hand out straight at him, just like, what are you doing? Because he knows. He shouldn't right have to cover that side. Like, no. the wall should have it. Yep. Now, Zach McMath looks tired. He looks, this man looks like he's seen some shit. And I'm like, Zach, you are not that old, bro. You need sleep? You need some melatonin, my friend? <laughs> well, we did, we did say that this was an interesting match for... Sporting KC because what we said last week was RSL is perfectly good at a lot of things. They're not great at anything. They had a negative goal differential of minus two headed into this game, even though they were in second place. Um, they had a, a fine record of six, six, and four at home, seven, five, and three on the road. So, like, depending on the day that you got them and whichever Sporting KC team showed up, there were chances, and and Sporting KC, to their credit, early on took advantage of the hole that RSL put themselves in, and uh, yeah, they they made it uh, very difficult for RSL because as soon as they scored that first goal, RSL is now playing for their lives to host a playoff game because the West is so bunched up. So the game opened up a lot more. There, but, yeah, really did. Uh, they made a substitution immediately after that goal. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the they knew the game was different. fourth minute non-injury substitution or whatever it was, fifth minute. Yeah, uh, Diego Luna, which by the way, isn't that an actor's name? 
Yeah, that's the guy who uh, stars in Andor, right? Andor and Rogue yeah. One. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he comes out, and I, his face was just like, "Fuck this." <laughs> he was pretty shell shocked. This sucks. Yeah, he was not happy. Uh, it, and announced the commentators, uh, Mark Rogodino, Rogan mm-hmm. Dino, who who was on our, our very before. first guest. Yeah, how funny is that? Uh, and then he was just like, uh, no fault of his own. He's got to come out. And that's right. a horrible feeling. That sucks. I yeah. do enjoy how, you know, it, it was a dog sale, but the way that it's uh, officially described uh, on MLSsoccer.com, Justin Glad's red card was for professional foul last man. And I just right. love the phrase professional foul. They don't just say dog sale, Like, I, I don't know whatever what that is. reason that they called it professional foul last man. Um, but then, yeah. Professional yeah. foul. Diego Luna comes on or off, excuse me, in in the fifth minute for uh, Marcelo Silva, and then uh, Christian Arango in the twenty seventh minute, one of their better players, one of their star strikers, comes off due to injury. So Rubio Ruben comes on. They've used two of their three sub windows, yeah, um, and two of their five available subs in the first twenty seven minutes of the game, and they're down a man. This was. Terrible start for RSL. Right. And anyone looking ahead, playing spoiler here, is like, well, then how'd you only win by one goal? Well, like that doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it doesn't. We're all very <laughs> baffled by it as well. <laughs> but Eric Tommy, he was super involved early on, obviously, because he drew the foul. He got the goal. But then in the 28th minute, just moments after uh, Christian Arango uh, comes off, uh, Tommy sets up in Denbe. They had all sorts of space, sport, they being sporting, all sorts of space on the left side all night. Granted, they were up a man, but in Denbe, Chaloui, whoever was running down the left side, there was a lot of space, and Tommy, they just were having trouble finding the final ball. They had multiple chances. They could not find the final ball, but Tommy perfectly weighted pass in the overlapping run to Ndenbe, and Denbe sees Johnny, late runner into the box, perfect cutback pass that they've been missing a few times, and then Johnny... Off of his left foot, his favorite foot, just first time, right into the bottom right corner of the net past McMath, 2-0 in the 29th minute, and you're up a man. Amazing. It's insane. It's insane. I, I, I'm, huh. It's so exciting. Uh, dude, Johnny, shush the crowd after this goal. Love it. It's the 29th minute, and he shushed him. I love it. <laughs> it's incredible. There's so much more game. <laughs> yeah. I have a coworker who's... Uh, you got a child that lives in Salt Lake, still cheers for sporting, said that their child was at the game and was was texting him before the game. They're like, they're just doing F-U-K-C chants. They're going wild. This place is, is is going nuts. I mean, there's still memories from that 2013 MLS Cup game. And so, yeah, Johnny probably goes out there. He's hearing F-U-K-C chants before the game, so I would take the opportunity to shush him myself too. So good. So you can't really hear that stuff on the broadcast, right? No. Uh, it's pretty pretty good to muffle that stuff really uh but man just the build up like that the the i know you're up a man it's hard to read into a whole lot when you get off passes like that but that's a good sequence of events Mm -hmm. so fun absolutely and then if things weren't going well enough for sporting kc before they get awarded a penalty kick late in the game when they're up 2-0 alan polito steps up to the penalty spot takes a pretty poor penalty kick, actually. It's not with a lot of pace. It's not placed well. McMath dives to the right direction, blocks it. Polito gets a little lucky because McMath basically parries it right back to Polito, who just volleys it straight into the back of the net off the rebound. I'm glad you said volley because it was kind of a volleyball thing. He, like, set it up for him. The way he blocked it, it just popped right up in the air. Yeah. It didn't go to the side. It didn't go low and away. It just, uh, Polito, yeah. oh, I'll get my rebound. Well, and credit to Polito because even though it was a pretty terrible penalty, pretty bad. It, I mean, he he followed it up, and I mean, he gets paid millions of dollars. He should finish this, but still, it, we've seen people with that kind of opportunity somehow shank it, somehow yeah. kick it off, you know, above the goal. He he fin- he puts it around McMath. He finishes it, and he puts Sporting KC up three zero with like twelve minutes left in the game. I think I tweeted at this time. Little insurance. That's that's the dagger icing on the cake. I'm getting my final game tweet ready. I'm thinking, you know, this this is just great goal differential. That's all this is, and uh, that's not what happened. Whatever you say, buddy. I'm glad you were feeling good. <laughs> I I you know we were watching the end of it when we got home, and uh, I was like, we very much 
could give this away. This is insane. Like, you draw that live. Yeah, I was seeing the end of it live probably last last 30 minutes. Probably came home about the 60th, 65th. Okay. And, uh, dude, just, we tried. We tried to give it away because a draw would have been a murder. Like, it would have it would have killed our season. Done deal. Nothing mm-hmm. to play for. Uh, but we held on. And, man, they probably goal of the freaking week from, uh, what's his name? From Vera. Yeah, just blasted it from outside the box. Just a laser. Yeah, this was uh, interesting. He's a center back, Brian Vera. Um, it was off a set piece. You know, again, we've said set piece defending. This isn't so much a set piece defending issue. Um, they they were down a man. It was off the corner. Uh, sporting, I believe it was actually Polito, headed it out of the box pretty far. It cleared it pretty far out of the box. And then Brian Vera just out of nowhere. Like you said, this has got to be goal of the week. Sets it down, one touch with his left foot. Sets up a, a nice little laser strike from... I don't know, 30 yards out that nobody's expecting him to take of all people. And yeah, that's one of those tip your cap. That's an incredible goal. Not much you can do there, but it's okay. It's 3-1, only nine minutes left. That, that you know, Polito goal's feeling a little bit more important right now, but but I was still feeling okay. I wasn't, dude. I, it was kind of feeling, you could hear the crowd getting behind him. You could just see their energy coming back to him. Uh, you could feel us being a little like, oh shit, you know, pack it in, get things together. Um, it just felt like it could have been a magical night for them. And that would have been insane. You know, Tim Milia didn't face a single shot on goal the whole first half. I mean, they were down a man and we were applying pressure and we were up two zero. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not surprised. He didn't do a whole lot at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was a very well played game. And of course, you know, you said Volder played well. He did. Rosero played well and Denby played great. It's a lot easier as a defender to play when your team's up a man because yeah. you're facing a lot less pressure. But you're right. Well, that goal in the 81st minute galvanized RSL a little bit. And then uh, Jefferson Savarino uh, in the 89th minute after, um, you know, Voliter can't quite get him and, and Castellanos is in there and he's kind of out of position. Savarino comes down, sneaks one, Again, a good finish past Melia in the 89th minute. It's 3-2 now. They've made up two goals um, being down a man. You know, there there was, I don't know, this was not how I expected this game to end, obviously. And then there was, what, five minutes, six minutes no, of stoppage time. There was like eight minutes, bro. Eight minutes of stoppage it time. eight minutes. It was a lot of stoppage time. And uh, there, were some, there were some scary moments, but that's enough. Eight minutes is enough to have a comeback there like that's crazy sporting got out of there uh three two it is a little bit of a bummer that they let up those two goals because goal differential you know you at the time you were wondering depending on how some other results were, were going to go could that come into play turns out it probably won't matter uh look but we've had many games where we lost and we talked about how we didn't deserve to lose we played very well and we just didn't get it done well this was kind of a reversal uh we won but they they came back like we should have shut them out. Yeah. You know, so and and Peter Peter sensed that, too, because a lot of the, uh, the journalists afterwards wanted to ask him questions about it. And he wasn't having it. He wasn't happy that they were asking him about the uh, the scoreline and uh, the late comeback. It's like, why are not you asking me about our play? You know? Yeah, for sure. He, I mean, he was asked about RSL's late rally and he said, what we should be talking about is we scored three goals on the road. RSL yeah. is a team that is very stingy in giving away goals. We got another three points to keep us alive at the moment. It's well done by the guys. The rest of it, it's the game. It's why people watch sports. Our guys battled to the end. They did what they had to do. They fought through it. We got all three points. Now we're on to the next game at home. I am, for one, happy that we do not play this weekend. We Our next game is Decision Day next weekend. And, you know, what? It, hopefully Rosero is just dealing with little contusion or something, that, that should be fine. Uh, hopefully, Fontas is better, man. Who knows what's going on with his uh, abdominal area. But uh, we got to have all hands on deck for that final game. Yeah. it's uh, Peter did get a little spicy again when someone asked him about RSL's late pressure, and he was like, would you rather be asking me about a team that played really well tonight but lost 2-1? to one? I look at his three goals on the road and winning 3-2. Of course, they're going to pump the ball at the end, and they did. 
We had to make a lot of changes with guys coming off the field, but we got the three points and that's what matters. He says, would you rather ask me that? It's because we have. We have asked you that, man. Like it, we've been in that position. Yeah. So it's just, uh, you got to take I, it. It's, it's ugly, but a W yeah. is a W. I, I get it. I mean, at that point, you went into who at the time was the second place team in the West. You got a huge, huge three points. And and yeah, he he probably is like, come on now, no good deed. Go, of course, there's always going to be things to clean up, but but yeah. Um, so it's, it'll be interesting now going into the next game. Um, Minnesota is an embattled team themselves fighting for a spot with, with a, a interim head coach because Adrian Heath has been fired. So there's lots to talk about, man. Um, I don't think we need to get into all of it this week since we have another, you know, next week we can really hit it hard. You know, yeah. the, the decision day conversation. I do want to talk about some of the scenarios because there is a Dallas game this weekend that's pretty sure. important. So we can talk about what what to expect and whatnot. But but yeah, let's let's take a break before we do that, um, and and we'll sort of talk about what's coming up over the next couple of weeks, what sporting should focus on, etc. Uh, but before we head into our break, the NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets, and DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game day this week. You know this is gonna—it's a big game for for Kansas City on Thursday night, so uh, they're going to be playing the Denver Broncos. That's a good rival. Broncos coming off a tough loss to the Jets, so maybe take a look, see if uh, a healthy Travis Kelsey's playing. You might be able to get a little uh, little bets on the Kansas City Chiefs there. Join uh, Travis Tate mania there, but uh, get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code KCSN. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code KCSN only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. Licensee partner, Golden Nugget, Lake Charles, Louisiana. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Good job, man. Good job on the DraftKings there. <laughs> uh, hey, something to point out. Eric Tommy, man, making the uh, team of the match day. He did. Uh, Deserve. I deserve because i mean not only do you draw the foul that changes the landscape of this game but you put away that first goal and then go ahead and get a little uh secondary assist later on yeah so, hell of a time one thing i didn't mention though logan and denbe has quickly become one of my faves yeah the man's got pace the man's got skills and he knows how to piss the fans off if he feels, <laughs> dude, if he feels a little tug or a little nudge in his back, yeah. he goes down like someone just punched him. Oh my god! And the fans realize it. Remember in St. Louis, they, oh, they were ooh, booing man. the hell out of him every time he got the ball. It was like someone that got an air ball in basketball, and they just chant air ball every time he yeah. touches it. Yeah. They were not liking in Denbe. That's what I like in a player. Frustrate the hell out of these people, man. Play well, and it was hard to tell on the broadcast, but. McMath kind of went after somebody after the final whistle, and I couldn't tell if it was in Denbe or, or who he was. And Denbe ended up kind of getting in the middle of it. I just couldn't tell who he initially was mad at, but they didn't really dwell on it and they didn't mention it. But things got scrappy after the final whistle. He got a yellow earlier in the game too, didn't he, McMath? He may have. I mean, they were there was there was some extracurriculars going on, right? Um, oh, McMath got it towards the end of the game in the seventh minute of stoppage time. Oh, uh, that's what it was. Okay. So maybe that's what you're thinking of there. Yeah. We're seeing behavior. Did you like how Tim Melia tr- was delaying restarts in like the first 10 minutes of this game? It was hilarious. <laughs> we hate that when people do it to us, but we never get to do it, man. Mm. And it feels great. We've talked about it before. You got to be smart. 
So this is one of those situations where, yeah, you got to basically do what you got to do to try to put yourself up in a situation where you can make the playoffs. And if that means taking a yellow for time wasting or, or being a little conca caffy, yeah, that's, dude. that's what you got to do. You're going to see the nicest rivalry in sports next weekend, and it's going to be a bloodbath. Oh, man. This is going to be... I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know what to expect. Minnesota obviously will not have their regular coach, Adrian Heath, who has been their coach as long as they've been in Major League Soccer. This is the beginning of a new era for Minnesota. It's yeah. fascinating to me that they made that decision while still having a shot at the postseason. This is not a D.C. United situation where they mutually parted ways with Rain, Wayne Rooney after their final game while they're officially eliminated, Minnesota still can make the dance. And they were like, no, we're done with Heat. This is this is not the guy. See, yeah, something must have happened behind closed doors or something we don't know about. But what, what's crazy to me is how intense this game will get because of so much on the line. Doesn't matter if anyone wins this game or not. They might not even matter. It may not matter one bit. Yeah, I mean, well, we have to win if we want any hope at getting in the playoffs. But you're right. Sure. We, we could win, and we could finish with, with 44 points, and that will be the three of the last five games that Tim talked about and everything. But, you know. Dallas could possible. win. Portland could win. San Jose could win. Depending on what happens with all three of those teams, we may miss the playoffs even if we win. We have an opportunity where we could finish as high as seventh and not have to even play in a play-in game at all. That's crazy. Or we could finish in ninth place. And it really all depends on what happens starting this weekend with FC Dallas and their Playing makeup game, Colorado, in a makeup game that, that got uh, postponed due to weather. There's, there's really no other MLS game because it's usually, uh, uh, or it's supposed to be an international break because there's um, some friendlies, USA is playing Germany, um, et cetera. Um, oh, I guess there's. Huh two other MLS games I didn't realize. Yeah, Galaxy play. Uh, The Galaxy host RSL and Nashville uh, host New England. But the one that we really care about is is Dallas and Colorado. Because if Dallas loses or draws, then they have 42 or 43 points. That creates three different pathways for Sporting KC to make the playoffs and three uh, and a more clear pathway to potentially sitting in seventh place when it's all said and done. Yeah, listen, I'm going to go uh, throw on my Colorado Rapids jersey real quick because all of you listening right now should 100% be a Rapids fan this weekend. There's no way on Mara Anderson. Never heard of her. I think that, uh, <laughs> that, listen, everyone should be cheering them on because what else are you going to watch? Yeah. You know, get come on, Rapids, get it done. The I mean, just don't lose, Colorado. Win or even get a draw. If you can get a draw against Dallas on the road, you'll have Dallas with 43 points, San Jose with 43 points, Portland with 43 points. All through 33 games, SKC will be two points out of 7th, 8th, and ninth place. So if Sporting won in this situation against Minnesota, and then all three of those teams either drew or lost... Sporting KC jumps up into seventh place and we don't play in the play-in game because if we end with the same amount of points as any of those three teams, Sporting KC already owns the tiebreaker because the tiebreaker is total wins. Sporting KC will have more total wins than any three of those teams. If Dallas wins or draws, or excuse me, if Dallas loses or draws, then in order for, for SKC to make the playoffs, we need a win. But then just one, just one of Portland... San Jose or Dallas would have to not win. They could draw or they could lose. And if any one of those teams does any of those things and Sporting KC wins, in the playoffs. I know. there's It's all there, right? But also they could all win and it was all for nothing. And you just will look back and be like, guess we shouldn't have dug that hole. They could... Sporting KC could host a home playoff game in the knockout match for the wild yeah. card. Feasible. Yeah. It's wild, Be- or you know, best they could have, they could be in the best of three and, and still host one. You know, it's uh... yeah, absolutely. This is and if they jump up, if things break right and they jump up all the way to seventh place, they don't even have to play St. Louis because that's that's what people have been talking. We talked about that. That's if Sporting KC does get into the playoffs, most likely scenario is it's eighth or ninth place. 
So you got to play that play-in game. And then the winner of that play-in game would go on to play St. Louis in a best of three series, starting at St. Louis, then go on to the lower seeded team's place, and then back to St. Louis if needed for a game three. So man, oh man. it would be great to send them home in their own state. Well, it'd be great to beat them at their home stadium and then send them home in Children's Mercy Park, but it'd also be fun to send them home in their own stadium. I don't want to even play them. How about that? <laughs> but I'd rather, well, yeah. I mean, would you feel better playing LAFC? They're also a great team. No, I mean, I, I think squeezing into the playoffs isn't going to get us very far, to be honest. I mean, it's it's nerve-wracking, man. But, uh, you know, I saw a, a big chart today about teams that underperformed mm-hmm. as according to their salaries. And Toronto FC was like one of the worst teams this year, right? They are officially the Wooden Spoon winners. The Wooden Spoon, the okay. Team. And they had the highest salary, correct? pre messy uh, assuming okay yeah. pre messy Messi sure. probably at, alone makes more than all of Toronto FC but but yes they <laughs> they are uh uh Toronto's uh, total team salary uh was 25 million 741 thousand and change uh that is the highest salary in all of MLS um but it, it's interesting cuz you you look at uh some of the highest paid teams number 1 Toronto not in the playoffs. Number two, LA Galaxy. Galaxy, yeah. Not in the playoffs. Number three, Atlanta. They made the playoffs, but they're not top of their league. Well, now number flipping four, over. Oh, sorry. Number four, DC. Not in the playoffs. Number five, Austin. Not in the playoffs. Four of the top five highest paid teams in MLS going into decision day are already eliminated. See, that just shows, man, you don't have to buy your team to do well in this league. Like, you don't. And St. Louis has one of the lowest Second uh, state teams, right? And look at them. They yep. crushed everyone. Second lowest. And, and technically, they, uh, according to uh, MLS Player Association, uh, no designated player uh, salaries, uh, which I thought Berkey maybe was a designated player, but maybe they made him a TAM player. I'm not sure. But gotcha. there are only three teams in the league that have no designated player reported salaries above $1.65 million, San Jose, New York Red Bulls, and St. Louis. So wow, it's uh, yeah, it was yeah. an interesting chart to see today. Yeah, I mean, people have made a lot out of does Sporting KC spend enough, etc. Because you, you look at who the you know MLS Cup winners are over recent history: LAFC, Seattle, Atlanta, etc. Those are teams that are not afraid to splash money. Now, there's a difference between salary and transfer fees, but you know. Spending money does not guarantee success, and I think Toronto is a very good representation of that. It's it's pretty bad to be the highest paid team and also be the literal worst team. That's worst case scenario. Yeah. So exactly. Um, but I don't know, man. This is just. Um, I hope I hope fans show up real big on October twenty first for Sporting Kansas City because there. This is all you can really hope for going into decision day is have something to play for. And we went through almost a full third of the season without winning a single game, and here we are on decision day with something to play for. That's nuts. Yeah. It, it, oh, man. It's, it's going to be fun. And they, they don't really show scores throughout decision day. They don't, they don't want the team to see. They don't want the team to be distracted. But they know. Um, yeah, I mean, but we'll be looking at our phones, of course, the whole time, and I'm sure you'll have uh, Apple TV pulled up watching other games, right? Yeah. Well, and you've seen this in, in soccer, uh, stadiums before and MLS before or whatnot fan. If the coaching staff's not keeping an eye fans that are near the bench, they're yelling scores out to players. So, so they know. So if, if sporting are up and then, you know, Portland or St. Uh, San Jose go down, players are going to know. And, and, you know, that's just motivation to, to seal the thing and, and make the playoffs. Can you imagine the celebration at Children's Mercy Park on October 21st if the final whistle blows, Sporting has won, and then we see Portland or San Jose lose or draw and it seals the trip to the playoffs? It's going to be a wild celebration. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. So I have a vision of, like, it'd be awesome if SKC beats Minnesota and there's still a little bit of time left 
So they throw one of those games up on the screen and the players are all there on the field and we're all there watching and we can all celebrate at the same time. It'd be pretty nuts. It would be. So, uh, I don't know. Sporting's beat Minnesota the last, at least the last three times they've played. Man, it's, yeah, it's possible. And now they're, uh, you know, uh, without a coach here. So, yeah. So it should be pretty interesting. Um, elsewhere around, well, before we move to elsewhere around the league, I also want to give a shout out to, uh, to John Polskamp because ah. John Polskamp, uh, is joining the U S men's Olympic national team for training camp in Phoenix, uh, and some friendly matches on October 11th and, uh, October 17th. So obviously the, uh, uh, Olympic rules are, it has to be a U 23 squad and, uh, yeah. Pulse Camp is is in that picture to potentially travel to France next summer and represent the United States in the Olympics. And that's pretty cool. That'd be so dope, man. I I just we haven't been able to watch meaning meaningful men's soccer in the Olympics for a bit. Sixteen years, really. It's the first time the U.S. has qualified for the Olympic tournament in sixteen years, and it did it by winning the 2022 Concacaf U20 Championship. So they are qualified. Awesome. They're qualified. Um, They're going to be in Paris. That'll be fun. Yeah, I'm very excited. It's it's not World Cup by any means, but it's still competitive soccer. So it's a competitive soccer. It's an international tournament. It's made up of U23 players. Um, it's it's going to be a, a pretty interesting thing. And hey, good for Pulse Camp because you know early to start this year, people thought it was Pulse Camp's job over Melia. Obviously, Melia has come back very strong, but there's still a pretty decent chance that Pulse Camp is the heir apparent to Tim Melia, and. One of the things I think that hurts me most about Melia's career is he was one of the best, if not the best, American goalkeeper or goalkeeper period in Major League Soccer and and arguably the best American goalkeeper in the pool. And the timing just never worked out for him to get a call up to the U.S. men's national team. And that really sucks because he deserved it. So it'd be great if Pulse Camp, especially if he stayed with SKC, could find a way to get in that picture. Yeah, for sure. But it's exciting. Um. So yeah, outside of, of of Sporting KC, like we said, there's been a whole wild list of, of coaches who have been fired or left. The most recent ones were Adrian Heath. He was fired on October 6th. Um, obviously, we haven't recorded since then, so that impacts Minnesota United coming into Children's Mercy Park next week. And then uh, Wayne Rooney, they mutually parted ways. He said he didn't have any plans after that, but it sounds like he's going to... Uh, be the next coach of Birmingham City in the championship over in England. So I think there's been like seven or eight coaches already fired this year. And that always starts the discourse around Peter Vermees. And does there's a I want to get your thoughts because they're it's not a big segment, but I've seen some fans that have said it might be better for sporting to lose to Minnesota and miss the playoffs because they think it'll force some change in the sporting KC organization as opposed to making the playoffs, and then not potentially making changes that need to be made. That's a wild, insane take to me. But that's been I, said. That there, it, it's not, it's not a lot. But if you go on the Reddit or you go on some parts of Twitter X, whatever you want to call it, it's a thing that's been uttered. That's that's asinine, dude. What what kind of education uh, is this? Like, why would you want that? Why, yeah, you know what? It, I don't know. I have I can't even argue against that because it's so stupid. Well, and I think it's it's pretty silly to just assume that, oh, if they don't make the playoffs, then that's a cut and dry. Peter Vermees is going to be fired as opposed to if they do make the playoffs, even if they lose in the knockout round, he's going to stay. Ownership's not going to make a decision based off of what happens on decision day. They're simply no. Not. And the dude's got like tenure, man. Like he's not, he's very well liked. The players never have anything bad to say about him. They love him. Yeah. Um. And, and it sounds like the ownership is very much happy with him. So, the owner work to get him into the playoffs here potentially. So, yeah, there are some things that I think there are legitimate questions about that could be some organizational change things. I, you know, I, I, I have um maybe some people that I want to get on to to talk about. You know, from a more outside perspective, what Sporting KC should do. I don't know. Maybe next week we'll try to get somebody on and, and talk about. Um, the state of sporting Kansas City, both heading into decision day and beyond. But I just, I think ownership regardless will point to the points per game in the last 24 games of the year 
after that first 10 game run and they'll be able to say whether you agree or disagree that over that stretch sporting kc's points per game was at or among the western conference leaders during that stretch and they'll be able to say peter corrected through first 10 games where you were missing alan Polito for a big chunk of them and you were still battling injuries it's not to say he's without criticism that's not to say there aren't things that could change but i just I think it's a, a naive perspective to think that if sporting misses the playoffs, it's a guaranteed change. Yeah. And I think and I it's wild to root against your own team when you have a shot at making the playoffs. <laughs> True. I mean, the New York Giants, when they won the Super Bowl and beat the 16-0 and or whatever, 17-0 and New England Patriots, they were a 9-7 and wild card team that barely made the playoffs. All you got to yeah. do is get in. Dude, that's how you get it. Those, those, those runs, man, I'm pretty sure teams in MLS have – made the wild card, the the knockout round or whatever, the mm-hmm. play-in round, and gone on to win the damn thing. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Portland was that. Yep. Uh, one time. Yep. The double post year. I might have been. I think so. Yeah. So. Anything could happen, man. This sport is crazy. Yeah. It's wild. I just, like I said, please pack this stadium on October 21st. I saw some people know. being like, I don't know if I want to be, like, it's, you know, get there. It's going to be there. Yeah. Sell it deal, deal with the shitty security to get in. It'll be worth it. <laughs> Maybe Dan will still have his mustache for that game. I plan to, man. This is, uh, it, it's, it, I feel powerful. Are you yeah. willing to, I'm going to put you on the spot. Did you have this mustache when we played RSL? I did. Are you willing to keep that mustache until we get knocked yes. out of the playoffs? <laughs> yes. I plan to, yeah, absolutely. Let's bring it. Playoff stash. Playoff stash, dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, I showed up to the KC Current game and Chris was like double checking me. Like, who's this guy? <laughs> Who are you? Because oh, I had the full beard action going on, you know. And now it's like, I don't know. Maybe I drive a van and give out candy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, show up to the game on October 21st. Maybe you'll see Dan in, uh, in his mustache. That's full of glory. So, wow. I'm telling you, I catch passes and date pop stars. Just hit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll break down the Minnesota game and talk in more detail about it next week. We'll, we'll break down the result of the Dallas Colorado game and 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 what the the actual you know final scenario is heading into Decision Day next week. And like I said, maybe we'll talk to some people and, and see what the the outside perspective on Sporting KC is. But in the meantime, we got a victory pod. It's an exciting time to be a fan right now. There's something to play for on Decision Day. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all for being with us throughout this season. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at NoOtherPod, at Dan Kuzer, at JCMax03. Shoot us an email, NoOtherPod at gmail.com. Leave us that five-star rating and review. And make sure you check us out on YouTube, KCSN Soccer, or on the Kansas City Sports Network app. But until next time, he's Dan. I'm Jimmy. We'll catch y'all later. See ya. Power stash, bro.